looking for a second BlizzCon spot in Tare. So do you know who your first opponent is? Uh, Tare. Yeah, we're kind of a unique case because out of all the competitors here, uh, Tare and I are the only ones who played each other already once at prelims. I lost him in the winner's round in the prelims. And I was able to take it down, uh, three to one. He ended up taking the first game and then queued his hunter and every one of my decks was able to beat his hunter deck. And I saw that he brought hunter again. I'm hoping that you know we can we can try and make uh, make history repeat itself. I feel like last time I played against him, like I made a lot of mistakes. I think it was because uh, it was like my first match of the day, and I didn't really warm up for anything. I would say there were five other players who, based on their lineups, I was favored against, and there were two of them who I didn't want to hit. One of them was Tare. Generally, I just try and bring things that kind of be aggro. I guess one way to fight fire is with fire, right? <laughs> so that's kind of what I did. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Tare. Uh, from what I understand, he's been around and has made a name for himself far before I did. So I certainly don't un underestimate him because things went my way the first time. I'm looking forward to the match. Welcome back to the commentator's desk. They saved the best for last, and this time it is no exception. It's Frodo and Brian Kibler back once again to bring you guys the last quarter final to determine who is going to be joining us for day number two and keeping their dreams alive for BlizzCon later this year between Avar and Tere. Kibler, it's been a joy so far. Uh, that last series was pretty exciting to watch down the that, wire. Yeah, that was that was fantastic. <laughs> there were so many epic moments in that series, and uh, you know, seeing Roof Twelve, who was my pick to win the event, you know, take down Freeze yeah. Mage four games in a row, basically. To, uh, to advance, that was great. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> your pick is going strong so far, and I believe the, uh, TJ is also going for it as well. We're going to kick things off with Mage versus Warlock. We're not going to skip a beat, uh, as Abar has mentioned it already in his interview that you know he he was able to get the better of Teray last time, and he's hoping to be able to do it again. Yeah, and uh, Abar is playing a little bit of an unusual version of Tempo Mage. We see one of those cards uh, that is unusual in his hand. He did mulligan it, Forbidden Flame. Uh, not really a common inclusion in most of these lists. Uh, but it, he does have a strong hand overall with the turn one Mana Worm, but no, actually, no copies of any removal spells to follow it up. And it's pretty weak against that turn one Flame Imp. Yeah, that's, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of times the mage wants to play something on turn one, but there also are times where playing the, the Mana Worm is not exactly always the right play on turn one, too, if it gets eaten up so easily, not just by things like Flame Imp, but also cards like Fiery War Axe, um, cause you to reevaluate. So sometimes you see some mage players hold on to that card for a while. And it will be uh, a coin into a Cult Sorcerer for Abar here, and Teray is not letting up the pressure. Uh, finding several options off this Dark Peddler. Mm -hmm. Another Flame Imp could help uh, increase his board presence. Mortal Coil not at its best in this matchup. Most of the minions uh, for the the Tempo Mage have more than one health, so it does pick up uh, that Flame Imp. And now Abar, he finds another Mana Worm. And still no spells, though, so those Mana Worms are a little bit awkward. Yeah, Abar's list is very interesting. I actually got a chance to sit down with Teray and talk to him about what Abar's list was like. And I think Teray just felt pretty confident overall, not just because of the lineup, but he also is un he also knows that Abar's relatively new to just competition in general. Abar's been playing Hearthstone for less than a year, and he's been competing for even less amount of that, just a few months. Um, and as such, Abar's like, you know, kind of, he's still young, innocent, and naive, right? <laughs> he still thinks very optimistically about something. He hasn't been beaten into a pole by, by the fact that a lot of players uh, are really brutal in some of these competitions. Well, speaking of beaten into a pulp, Tore has dealt nine damage himself so far with three Flame Imps. Uh, and now Abar is really going to need a spell to activate these Mana Worms. There's a Mirror Image that will pump the Mana Worms and give him a little bit of... Uh, of defense on the board can help him get some trades in. So definitely a nice draw here, but it does activate Terre's Sea Giant, potentially. Yeah, the Sea Giant, the infamous Sea Giant, which uh, <laughs> Terre did uh, end up bobbling last time, but didn't it cost him the game? Um, just just to finish up my previous point, like it, the, the deck construction for Maybar is actually very interesting. He has t uh, two Forgotten Torches and like a Cabalist Tome, but he doesn't have a lot of those card draw sources that really make Forgotten Torch a real threat because what ends up happening is the Temple Mage sometimes transitions from being very early game board centric 
to extremely burn oriented, and they try to finish the game through Roaring Torch combinations. Um, but that's why players like Hotform for a while were putting in Acolyte to Pain, because they just really felt like they needed to get to that. Uh, but Abar chose not to, instead putting things like Forbidden Flame. So this is what Tere was talking to me about, and how, why he felt really confident in this match specifically. Yeah. Well, the uh, Sea Giant is a big factor in this match. 8-8 eight, eight down on turn 4 for Tere uh, is giving him a threat that is going to be very difficult for Abar to deal with, especially considering the uh, newer player does not really have many spells in his hand. He, Arcane Intellects finds some more, but at best he can trade his board for those Flame Imps and still be facing a Giant. Yeah, this is the power of having that early game board as the, the Zoo player. Tereid's, of course, running the older school Zoo. Nothing really too new. Uh, Malkazar, Zimp, things like the, the, the Silverware Golem. They're not in this deck. They're just classic Zoo, which still proves to be very powerful. Yeah, the uh, Sea Giants, he said he that he likes this particular build because of them. They allow the deck to have very powerful uh, game-swinging plays against other aggressive decks. As we saw right here, you know, that Sea Giant is really defining the pace of this game because it's very difficult for Abar to remove with all of his damage-based removal. Well, he doesn't exactly have the cleanest removal either. Forbidden Flame, very awkward to use. Um, you know, it how does he pair it together with the rest of his hand. He can use Forbidden Flame to deal two damage. He can freeze the Giant to stall for more turns. He has to hope that this Frostbolt uh, spray damage from the Flame Waker's effect doesn't hit the the Imp. But oh, there's wow. another Giant! <laughs> yeah. And this is a really rough spot for Avar here. A second giant comes down. The first one already really difficult for him to deal with. And now Tere has the opportunity to just trade with this Flame Waker, leaving himself with the only minions on the board. 16, 19 power on boards. So that's just like it, it, it kind of represents Lethal just now. And Apar, you know, sowing the unfortunate seeds of what his deck list has brought him. You know, the, the Forbidden Flames are awkward, especially when you draw them in tandem. And now he's got the hope that he's not going to die. Yeah, you know, the Flames would have been pretty good for Abar if he'd found them earlier in the game and able to perhaps eliminate uh, some flame of the Flame Imps yeah. before they got, they really dealt just so much damage to him. Uh, but his Mana Worms just remained stranded in his hand because he just didn't have uh, access to those spells in the early turns of the game. Uh, Terry just pushing his advantage here. Power overwhelming will allow an Imp to take down the Flame Waker and so much damage pushed to Abar's face. Uh, he's got Yogg, but this is not a Druid deck. He cannot ramp into that before turn 10, and uh, it looks like there's just not going to be a way out of this. Yeah, the Thaunos can allow him to Hero Power to draw a card, but there's not really many cards that can save him. And just like that, game number one goes in favor of Terrain. So he jumps out to a very early lead. And, you know, maybe that's a good precedent already because you know, even despite the fact that the deck building was interesting from Abar, the match was really tough for the Mage in general. Certainly. Yeah, the, uh, the, the Tempo Mage deck can struggle if it does fall behind. And if it doesn't have access to uh, the Sources Apprentice and Arcane Blast, those are some of the most important cards in that matchup. It, it's hard for it to get back into the board. All right, well, you saw a little bit of his choices in the game. Why don't you hear about some of the life things that are going on A bars outside the game in this little piece as we get ready for game number two. Talk to me a little bit about what you do outside of Hearthstone. So I am a communications expert for Michigan State University, not just a Hearthstone player. I'm, I'm a real person. I'm an adult. They forced me to be an adult, like to run, like to spend time with my fiance, my dog. How do you balance having a normal life and uh, you know a full-time job and playing Hearthstone at a high enough level to make it to a championship? There are points in the season, especially if you're trying to play super competitively, where it's really important that you dedicate a large percentage of your time to Hearthstone. I try and schedule my life so that I'm making sure that if I know that that's coming, then you know maybe I do something fun with my fiance a couple days before. So what do people sort of back home think of all this? Yeah, I've gotten a ton of support. My brother has had zero doubt through this whole process I was going to get here. I think he was the only one, but just the whole time he's like, nah, you're winning this thing. He's responsible for getting me into it, ah. so I definitely have to thank my brother. What about your fiance? Does she play Hearthstone? Does she... Yeah, she doesn't play Hearthstone. Just give her an aggro shaman deck, man. Put her on the ladder. I could teach her. Yeah. I could teach her. 
do you think that gaming has contributed to your life positively? I think there's sometimes a stereotype from from people who haven't given it a try that it, it rots away at your brain. It's just not the case. It's, it's a critical level of thinking skills that, that you engage when you play Hearthstone. I like to think of myself as someone who could be a bastion for the gaming community and talk about how it can be such a positive thing for our lives. I'm not sure if Abar was completely aware of what it meant when he says to the game community that he wants to be a bastion. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the the Overwatch short, The Last Bastion? I have. I have never been so like sad for a robot before. I felt actually that's not the true. Same. I, I watched before Wally. And after. Wally too. Wally was great as Wally well. Was great. But Bastion made me feel Wally level feels, and and I've never you know for a video game. Kid. Are you a Bastion Gibbler? I, I I would consider myself more of a uh, you're, you're a 76 <laughs> i'm not as young as i once was no i'm, I'm actually a winston <laughs> i play winston and uh, and roadhog actually yeah. but admirable steward born obviously and, of course uh, i'm zarya so all we right. got we got all our roles set here <laughs> abar versus uh Tarek going again number two we have shaman versus druid abar off to a good start getting that wild growth i have been hearing some players theorize about throwing away wild growth i know it sounds stupid but they say that shaman starts off so fast that you're just looking for innervate you're like you need to find innervate that fast why not both okay or why there not you go both? <laughs> oh or why not everything sure maybe if you pick up uh, some other ways to combine with vile teacher pal the wild it'd be really good and yeah, this is actually a, kind of a weird hand from abar here the uh the double innervate violet teacher is actually what it looks like he's going for, and he decides I'm just going to get things going right away. Wow. The uh, the power of the violet teacher opening like this, I think, has been somewhat lessened uh, against shaman in particular, thanks to the uh, re uh, release of maelstrom portal and spirit claws. We actually see Tere has both of those, mm -hmm. so the possibility that he can just deal with pretty much all of the resources Abar has had this entire game. Uh, with just a couple of uh, of cards from his own hand is kind of terrifying. Yeah, and right now, I mean, Abar's essentially all in on this teacher, which does, again, make me a little worried for him. Um, having the two innervates would normally lead to a lot of powerful swing turns consecutively, but right now he's got wild growth, and he's got hero power, and those two options he's weighing through his mind right now. Yeah, now... I mean, this is a little bit of an awkward spot because he obviously wants to wild growth and get the the student from his teacher, um, but his opponent, you know, has the uh, the totem golem here, which can potentially just kill his teacher as well. He is just going to go with the wild growth, and now there's a tunnel truck picked up from Tare. Now he can't get the uh, violet teacher off the board just yet, but he can set up spirit claws, potentially kill the one one. And he has actually a few options here. He could choose to just go, just go face with his, his uh, golem. Because he puts his opponent in a position where attacking into the totem golem is at least a little bit awkward. Because he, he has access to, access to the, uh, the portal next turn or the blood mage along with the spirit claws, which can allow him to just attack into the, uh, the violet teacher as well. I guess you would be afraid of what your opponent can do on turn four. But you're, you know that your opponent hasn't planned for it, that he's drawn everything from the top of his deck. Right. So that is something to consider as well. Choose a Spirit Claws. Yeah, I think there's got to be at least some some thought of uh, attacking into the teacher here for fear of swipe. Because if you lose your Totem Golem without getting any damage there, uh, or perhaps this Mulch now. Yeah. And Tare not attacking into the Violet Teacher means that there's no damage on that Violet Teacher. So it kind of has free reign here. Yeah, it doesn't feel the greatest to mulch a two-mana minion, but well, on average, the results aren't amazing. In this case, the game actually might go long enough that Sagath is relevant. Yeah, and that Rock Biter is a great draw from Tare because that gives him the ability with the, the spell power from uh, the Blood Mage to just take down that Violet Teacher. And now Abar is down to just a single card in his hand. And thankfully for him, it is Azure Drake, so it will replace itself and give him a little bit, little bit more gas. Right. Not a bad draw either. Violet Teacher helps him make a lot of other cards really powerful. Wrath can cycle and create a minion. Power of the Wild is great. Living Roots is not bad either. 
Now, by the way, uh, Ture is playing the mid-range Shaman variant. You can see that by the Thunder Bluff Valiant. And that's a deck that's been growing a lot in popularity. People say that it might even be the strongest version of Shaman right now in Lighter. Yeah, the introduction of uh, both Maelstrom Portal and Spirit Claws has given the mid-range Shaman deck so many tools to deal with the early game. Uh, Claws in particular, allowing you to leverage the value of Blood Mage Thalnos, which we just saw last turn, as well as Azure Drake, mm -hmm. uh, to power that up and give you more tempo early in the game. I don't know about you, they never need either. Apparently they get Spell Power Totem every time they need it. Well, Tyre didn't just now, so... Yeah, he didn't need it. He didn't, that's true. <laughs> well, actually, if he got Spell Power Totem, he could Maelstrom Portal attack and just oh, kill his okay, opponent's yeah. you're sky. Right, you're right, you're right. You're <laughs> Would've been pretty good. So he did need it, huh? I, I didn't know it worked that way. I guess uh, the funny thing, too, is based off uh, his hand. I mean, Trey can also play the very slow game. Mm -hmm. How does Drew deal with Saga the Solipter? It is not easy. <laughs> I mean, with how many resources Abar has already uh, invested, I mean, even just that uh, Thunderbolt Valiant is potentially scary pretty soon. Man, that is not bad at all for uh, no. Abar, because now he can load onto the board and then refill his hand with Nourish if his opponent deals with this board, which you sort of anticipate your opponent doing. He did hold a lot of cards. His best turn four play was a Flame Tongue Totem. <laughs> so you're feeling like he's got some heavier cards that maybe he uses to swing the board. Yeah, there is the, there's a couple of, op, uh, couple of options here. There's the Violet Teacher into Living Roots, which you can use to kill the, fl uh, the Flame Tongue Totem and then clear your opponent's other totem, mm -hmm. which does develop a bit of a board. Uh, he could just nourish plus living roots to try and build to a stronger turn later on. That ends up being uh, somewhat problematic given the fact that he's already used two innervates. So loading up your hand with more spells when you know you're going to be somewhat lacking in terms of the overall mana to actually play them is probably worse than just playing to the board here, which is what he's going to go ahead and do. So he's going to go ahead and living roots. Can choose either target, doesn't really matter which one he, uh, he kills in terms of getting any damage on either of his minions. And there he now, so Abar now has a pretty solid board. Uh, Tare with a lot of cards in hand, but not enough mana to really make a big play. Yeah, he can't guarantee a clear because Lightning Storm, if it rolls the highest, I guess, the, the three damage, if it gets three damage on uh, all of the, the, the Lightning Spikes, then Maelstrom Portal can clear it, but it's not guaranteed. It's hard to make sure that you can get to that position. If you roll Spell Power Totem, and he gets four on everything, then that's also a possibility. Well, spell power plus storm, if he just gets four on the Drake, would be would be great because he would have the the damage left over from Spirit Claws to take down. And there it is, spell power. Oh man. There it All is. Right. Okay, so now his lightning storm just feels like uh, the most important play here, right? Yeah, I mean, if he's going to totem here, I imagine it's in anticipation of playing that Lightning Storm. We'll see how much damage it does to that Azure Drake. Okay. Does not take out the Drake, so he is able to clear uh, off the Violet Teacher and the Student, but the Drake lives with just one health. That is enough that he can kill it next turn with Maelstrom Portal. Right. So that's pretty crucial. Yeah, but uh, he has to commit his mana to that, though. It's true. He, he, he won't be able to develop too much of his own board next turn because of that. And Abar able to reload with Nourish here. Finds ah, some pretty good action with Ragnaros to be able to play next turn. Your opponent just played Lightning Storm. Um, I guess you want to start thinking about ways to be aggressive. Even though Blood Mage Thanos um, is a card draw and ultimately your hand's a little bit low, I do think pushing the, the tempo a little bit is really important against your opponent. And now uh, let's see what Teray's options here is just not very strong or impressive. A yeah, little bit awkward for Tare here. He can play either a thing from below or two Tunnel Trogs and follow it up with Maelstrom Portal to kill the Azure Drake. He could just use his uh, Hero Power, hope for Spell Power once again to clear the board with the Maelstrom Portal. But those Tunnel Trogs in particular are looking quite weak. Just He has no overload to back them up, and his opponent is ahead in the board with minions that can kill his Tunnel Trogs. I mean, there is a possibility that Maelstrom Portal also gets a Stone Chest Bore to clear that the board. Factual. It's, ha it's, it's happened before in my games. So I I, th I don't really hate the the Maelstrom portal. I don't like leaving the Azure Drake up because it feels like you can get blown out way too easily by a swipe. Yeah, he will go ahead and use the portal finds himself. All right. A Buccaneer. I should have combined with Doomhammer. Oh, <laughs> man. Because the Buccaneer adds uh, one extra attack to the first the weapon that you equip, and that would have made Doomhammer a 3-8.
Now, Apar, he did originally have that Ragnaros plan. Has he chosen to pivot? I'm not sure. Ragnaros still seems like a really strong option. Ragnaros is a little bit weak overall against Shaman just because of their hero power and Hex. Gives them both minions that can absorb the, the fireballs as well as uh, the ability to, to get, kind of get a big tempo swing you spend your entire turn on it. That said, Abar doesn't really have that much else to do otherwise. He doesn't have great options that'll really deal with this board, so... He is just gonna go ahead and play Azure Drake, gonna try and find some better option here. Finds Anixia. Okay. That's gonna look attractive when your opponent has played Maelstrom Portal and Lightning Storm already, and you're gonna have nine mana next turn. Right. Okay, well, looks like uh, Trey's got that turn seven Thunderbluff Valiant play, but uh, is there a better option here? It looks like I mean, the, the Thunderbluff Valiant plus hero power, and he can attack into the Azure Drake oh, and the uh, either the, the uh, Panther or the Blood Mage Thalnos. Gives him a bit of a board and really threatens uh, to force Abar to remove the Thunderbluff the next turn. It even puts Abar in a kind of an awkward position if he were to just want to play Anixia then he's facing down the, the threat of, okay, well, if you do have an AoE, there's just this unanswered Thunderbluff Valiant, and if that minion remains in play for more than a couple of turns, it can be very difficult to come back. Yeah, the really big downside is that unless he gets the Healing Totem, that thing from below gets challenged just by the Blood Mage Thanos. And then, I don't know if you're feeling too bad about playing Nixio right after you trade for this 5-1. I mean, I think that it definitely looks like a great spot for it, considering your opponent has utilized quite a bit of their AoE. Mm -hmm. None of your other options are particularly attractive. The fact that he drew Raven Idol is going to complicate things a little bit. He may think, okay, well, can I Raven Idol and find something that can remove this Valiant? But okay. I imagine <laughs> now that that's attacked, he's just going to go ahead and play Anixia. Sure. And, uh, you know, of course, Tere knew that this was a possibility. And... Now, Flantong Totem plus the hero power. What's his board situation looking like? Four, seven. No, it's not a clean removal. It's awkward. Well, he does have the, the Rock Biter as well. So he, he can invest that and take out Anixia with his Totem. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's still, you know, obviously not what he'd love to do, considering his opponent has enough min uh, minions left over just to remove the Thunderbolt Valiant after that. Yeah, and what you can do is try and hope that Saga the Sothra just really grinds his opponent down resources. But we know that uh, there's a lot of gas that's available to Abar, and that's one of the flexible things about Raven Idol. You can use it for, in this position, looking for spells to draw cards or remove. Um, or even in instances where you don't have any more minions, you can use Raven Idol to just pick up a random minion. I mean, Abar, with two Raven Idols in his hand, has just so many options that he can find next turn that would be absolutely devastating here. If he finds Savage Roar, if he finds Savage Wisp Roar. of the Old Gods, that's another one. so many cards that can really... Oh, well, that's also pretty powerful, but we're going to start with Raven Idol, I have to imagine. Yep. What is in the box? Looking for anything to bolster his board, Power of the Wild, like you said, Starfall. Starfall is interesting. It clears, it only by itself clears one minion. But it sets up with Swipe really well. Yeah, too. Starfall into Swipe can actually kill everything on Tare's board. And this is going to be a devastating turn. Oof. Yeah, it's as, almost as good as it gets in terms of clearing the board. Um, didn't get to swipe the face, I guess it's the only complaint. Curses. Yeah. <laughs> and he also has Ragnaros to push damage too, so you know, Terrain's gonna really need a lot of a lot of work done here by Saga the Slither, and he is a big dude. Dun, 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 dun. I think that's what that sound effect is. Nailed it. Yeah. They just have me do all the sound effects. They don't need like a whole orchestra or whatever. I'd buy that expansion. <laughs> With gold though. Oh, okay. I saved up a lot. In my defense. Raven Idol looking for some way to. Savage Roar is just it. lethal here. He doesn't even need to go Ooh, for Ragnaros. Savage Roar okay. plus Druid of the Claw, I believe, just ends the game on the spot. Yeah. W worth counting just to remind yourself how many whelps there are, Where but with what? 12 damage guaranteed with the Savage Roar yeah. plus whatever's on board here. That's going to be more than enough. And you now Tere got a really good mulch result, but it didn't really matter. And hey, that double Innervate teacher play ended up being able to work out for Abar. Yeah, Abar was able to follow it up with uh, you know, some good removal as well as crucially that Nourish that found him more threats and uh, was able to turn the tables on Tare's mid-range shaman. So the series is evened up. The mid-range shaman does falter here. 
for Ture. Let's get to know Ture a little bit better as we get ready for game number three in this best of seven set. There's, there's actually been only 31 players that have actually participated at a world championship at BlizzCon, and you're one of them. Uh, do you think your experience in Hearthstone gives you an edge uh, against a lot of these competitors who, for some of them, it's their first tournament? Yeah, I think it gives me an edge in the sense that I won't get so uh, nervous anymore. Also kind of gone through everything before, like dress rehearsals and interviews and everything. So I guess I'm kind of more used to it, and it probably won't affect me as much. Uh, talk to me about sort of your strategy when going into a tournament. How do you build your lineup? Where do you start with sort of a deck? Like, I try different things, I guess. Like, sometimes um, if it's done well before, I'll stick with it. Or if, like, what I've been doing isn't really working, I'll change it up. I kind of moved on from trying to, like, counter the meta, and now I try to kind of, like, play part of the meta, and then if I can find a deck that I feel is really strong, such as Cthulhu Control Warrior, then I'll bring that as well. So kind of have a bit of a mix of what's like really strong right now and what I find personally to be pretty strong. What's your playstyle in a game of Hearthstone? Well, first off, I think Rusty would disagree and say there's no such thing as a playstyle. He's coming around though, he's coming around. It's usually more, uh, I guess, defensive and the decks I brought for the tournament aren't really that case. But generally I prefer like control style decks where you can play a longer game and um, make more decisions to give you a better chance to win. Number three here between Abar and Tere. Best of seven tournament. Who's going to the day number two, joining the other semifinalists? So uh, checking in with anybody who's tuned in a little bit late. We had the Zoo Warlock up against the Temple Mage, and the Zula Warlock was able to prevail. And then we just recently saw Abar's Druid get an explosive start and take out the shot. All right, well, it will be Abar playing the Zoo deck this time against Tare playing Midrange Shaman. And this is a matchup that I've heard a lot of players say uh, has changed dramatically with the release of Karazhan. Uh, the combination of the claws as well as Maelstrom Portal, Spirit Claws and Maelstrom Portal, give you both the uh, the ability to fight for the early board and the ability to clear off large boards that really didn't exist before in sufficient quantities of Shaman. Yeah, there was this belief that the mid-range Shaman was a lot weaker to the Zoo Warlock compared to pre prior to Karazhan and then compared to after. And I, I tend to agree. I think the Maelstrom Portal is really impactful. Spirit Claws helps you stabilize the early game board. And that's all the Shaman cares about, because the quality of their minions with Thunder Bluff Valiant, as you saw Alec here, the Wind Lord, Flame Wreath Faces, are much higher on average than the usual Zoo Warlock draw. Now, keep in mind, uh, Abar is playing the same list that we saw Hot Meowth play as well previously. Yeah, the, uh, the Demon Fire list, which is really made possible primarily by Malkazar's Imp. A lot of players uh, look at Malkazar's Imp and think, oh, I want to play this alongside a lot of discard effects like Darkshire Librarian, the Silver Golem. But it also happens to be a one-cost demon. And uh, that is the use that uh, Abar and Hot Meowth have used so far. And we see a demon come down and then coin Soulfire, getting rid of the second Soulfire from Abar's hand. See a little bit of shake of the head from, uh, from Abar here, likely fearing the possibility he no longer has removal for Totem Golem, but there is no Totem Golem for Tare. Yeah, instead, uh, Abar now has free reign to develop onto the board here however he chooses. It seems like Arts and Squire and Voidwalker opens up his path a lot more. Um, normally, you want to try and fill the, the curve with higher cost minions because ones are always easier to fit than twos. But, but in this instance, one. because Lance Carry is not necessarily strong um, in in this position where you're kind of loading it all on this Flame Imp, I, I do think that if you add Lance Carry's buff to a Divine Shield minion, it actually gets a lot stronger. Yeah, that's generally where it's at its best. I had a chance to talk to Hot Meowth a little bit about this particular Why style of Warlock deck. And he said that he was, you know, a little bit shaky in terms of uh, whether or not it was better than more traditional decks. And we saw him have a little bit of shaky performance with it uh, earlier today as he narrowly got past Monsanto with the deck. But uh, a, a big part of the power of the deck is the combination of the Lance Carrier buff with those Divine Shield minions. It's a pretty good, uh, good point there. Now, one thing to also keep in mind as Trey plays the Totem Golem, just his best minion, um, is to add 
Uh, Abar, Abar, he's playing a list that is, is is very similar, but once again doesn't have a lot of that uh, that big board control compared to Therese's Zoo Warlock deck. So what's interesting is always the what happens if Abar loses and they match up against each other. Because when Tere brings like his Zoo Warlock with a bunch of Sea Giants, he's anticipating a lot of people to bring these board flood opportunities and, and get cheap Giants. So I, I haven't really seen that Zoo Warlock clash too much with other styles. I want to see how it works. Yep. But Abar within a kind of an awkward spot here. No great opportunities to make good trades here. He could use his Lance Carrier on his Flame Imp to trade into uh, this Totem Golem, but that leaves him with very little power left in the board. Uh, he is just going to go ahead and trade in and Lance Carrier up the Voidwalker. So he's going to go ahead and, and sort of diversify his threats here a little bit uh, and ensure that he has some substance left in the board. Uh, Tare does have, uh, oh, there's another Totem Golem of his own. He has that Lightning Storm, which has the potential to be very strong, but he really needs spell power because two of uh, Abar's threats here, and including the biggest one on the board, uh, are only a 50% shot to kill with that Lightning Storm. Yeah, it's a really good point. I don't think it's worth risking right now on a Lightning Storm, which doesn't, on, on average, is not going to clear everything. So if you play Totem Golem, then you're going to be stuck with four mana next turn. That's also another awkward moment as well because nothing really pairs well with that if you get um maelstrom portal with spell power totem it still is not very guaranteed to clear anything uh, I so i i definitely feel like jerry in an awkward spot where he constantly has to waste mana crystals here and there those add up over time absolutely the the efficiency of your your mana usage in all of these tempo based matchups can be crucial and tare he just recognizes that none of his plays work out well and is hoping all right he does get the clear on the biggest of the two uh the two larger minions there uh, and life tap for Abar. He can reload on this Imp. Oh, okay, he's got a couple of options. Can choose to either Lance Carrot or Demon Fire. He's gonna go with the Demon Fire, which does protect his minion from a Maelstrom Portal, which is quite important. Yes, certainly. And that means that pretty much uh, uh, Therese plays can get threatened in almost any capacity. Once again, if he wants to play Feral Spirits, he's going to be overloaded for two, so he's stuck with four mana. But if one of the Spirits survives, then Flame Tongue Totem and Totem Golem, Maelstrom Portal piece a lot easier. So while this turn, you don't necessarily get the full benefits of filling out some of these support cards, next turn you can. And Tare kind of debating, looks between the Totem Golem and the Feral Spirit here. One of the awkward things about the Feral Spirit is, you know, he just gets one of them eaten by Abar's uh, Imp immediately. Yeah, it's true. So he he basically will have to follow up with Maelstrom Portal or else he essentially loses his entire Feral Spirit, which is a lot of mana over the two turns, uh, to this Imp. Brand Barnsbeard for Abar, which is great with Lance Carrier, but not necessarily when your opponent can easily eat the thing uh, that you are pumping. That seems to work out pretty well if Abar chooses to just play those two minions in tandem because uh, Tere has the Flame Tongue Totem I and the Maelstrom Portal, yeah. which should clear everything except for the Lands Carrier. And I, I imagine we may see Abar go with uh, exactly the Bran into Carrier, pumping the, the, the Bran itself, giving him a 6-4. A Build your own Volcanic Drake right here. Yeah, not bad. And, I mean, that at least forces your opponent, if he has to play Spirit Claws, has to take a lot of damage. Or, uh, it's assuming that Tare had it, but he doesn't. And uh, I think Tare is very likely going to be priced into Flame Tongue plus Portal here to clear everything but that Lance Carrier, as you mentioned. It does leave him with uh, no Overload next turn, going into seven mana with Thunder Bluff Valiant in his hand, which is a very powerful potential swing turn, uh, allowing him to just really start bolstering his board from nothing. You know, it's interesting that we perceive Doomhammer as being one of these insanely powerful cards in Shaman, maybe one of the best, if not the best. And yet, uh, we see some of these mid-range Shamans cutting the Doomhammer from their lists. Well, many mid-range Shaman players have, haven't included Doomhammer, have included one Doomhammer for quite a while, but in particular, the, the style of the mid-range Shaman decks typically is that they want to uh, win the game via attrition and Powerful cards like the Thunderbolt Valiant that allow them to just establish this board, which is very difficult for their opponent to deal with. Doomhammer can give them some burst potential, but you get that from Alakir, you can get that from uh, Bloodlust is another card, and it, it can be Doomhammer competes with Spirit Claws, which is so powerful controlling the early turns. Well, Tare goes with the plan of.
Flame Tongue plus the Maelstrom Portal, and Abar is reduced to just that Lance Carrier, who fortunately can kill the the Brave Archer that came out of the portal. Yeah, not really threatening board from the Shaman yet, but if he Five, even leaves up that Flame Tongue seven. totem, that totem can start fighting on its own. Ooh, interesting. Coil is pretty good draw, or pretty good opportunity because you can draw with it, and then now you can Ooh, snipe yeah, the this flame is, tongue. This is a great, uh, great sequence of draws and discovers from Abar here. Gets to take out the entire board, making the potential threat of that Thunderbluff value much lower, and forcing Trey on the back foot once again. I like here the Windlord is pretty nasty if you can have a big board to support him. It's also just pretty decent at removing a board kind of like the one Abar has right now. That's true. And if Abar is able to set up just a couple of minions, uh, and this <laughs> this draw right here, we've seen this is a, we've seen this a number of spots with the the demon fire drawn with no demons to buff. It's also worth noting this can be used as a removal effect. So if Abar wants to uh, just throw a couple of minions into the Thunderbluff Valley, and he can get two damage off the demon fire uh, to finish that off. It doesn't seem like there's a convenient pairing with Defender of Argus and Demon Fire to cleanly remove the board without tossing almost his entire board away. I would expect that we see Abar uh, using Life Tap this turn. He's a little bit low on resources, and like you mentioned, there's no great opportunity for him to use both of the spells in his hand right now. Uh, he, can, he can go ahead and attack two minions into the Thunder Bluff, use Demon Fire, so I would expect to see him dig a little bit to try to uh, fight back in the resource axis of this game. Yeah, I wonder if another possibility is he starts getting aggressive, perhaps Defender. Oh, that you start just attacking as opposed yeah. to trading all the time. All right, he's actually this is this is okay. Yeah, okay. he's able he's able to retain some of his board, remove everything on the opposing side, get a decent trade here. Sure. This does open the possibility of just this Alkir clearing off uh, off both these minions if Tare wants to do that, and then the, the the threat of pushing for a lot of damage the following turn with Flame Tongue plus Rockbiter. If he plays Alec here, what is Avar's best response to it? He doesn't really have much in his deck. He's, he's already Doom Guards. He's already discarded uh, one of his soul fires to the other. So That's in true. terms of the removal effects he has, it can immediately deal with it. It's very, very limited. Uh, I believe his only way to, to take it off the board immediately is either an Ar a buffed Argent Horse Rider or a Doom Guard, as you mentioned. And that is an Argent Horse Rider, but no buff. And this damage is going to bring Abar down to 16, and I believe that's just short of lethal from uh, from the Windlord right here. Rock Butter plus Flame Tongue buffs it up to eight. So Tare could attack for 16. I actually would not be surprised if he did just that to force Abar to a position where he can no longer use his hero power to life tap. Yep, uh, play play pretty much your entire hand because you're, if you set your opponent down to two health or less, they really can't do yep. much. They can't they can't life tap at that point. They have to win with the next card. And at, even if they do clear the board, they only draw one card for the rest of the game. And that is exactly what Tare does, bringing Abar down to just two life. And there really is no draw that Abar can have, and he recognizes that and just concedes on the spot. There you go, Alec here, the Windlord. People who open it up in the Welcome Bundle, that's where you can stick them in. Yeah, the blower's can. wondering, like, is he is he as useful as some of the other ones? Absolutely, in some cases. Swat your opponents like insects. There you go, there you go. All right, so as we get ready for game number four, Abar has shared some of his thoughts on the gaming community. He wants you guys to listen to it, so we'll be back in just a sec with game number four. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about um, just gaming culture in general and where it should go towards in the future now that gaming is becoming more mainstream. Yeah, one of the unique aspects about gaming is that you know inherently by playing the game, all of us are behind the veil of the internet. In some ways, that's a very positive thing, right? Because people don't have to worry about the challenges of their everyday lives and what people think about them based on their physical appearance. And when we're playing Hearthstone, at least for the time being, you know, we're, we're Jaina or we're Gul'dan or we're whoever we want to be. On the other side of that coin, there's less accountability for the things that people say. That allows people to make negative comments about people without really having to own them. And I, I would like to see that change. I would like to see us make not just the Hearthstone community, but the esports community in general um, as, as welcoming 
as inviting, as inclusive as we possibly can. All right, time for game number four. Abar versus Ture, with Abar saying a few words about uh, just our community as a whole. Godspeed, Abar. <laughs> You're fighting the good fight. <laughs> Absolutely. Braver Absolutely. man than I could ever be. <laughs> as uh, we go into game number four, he's going to need all the bravery he can get. We're going to go into Hunter versus the Zoo Warlock. This is the deck that you were pointing out right before um, during the break is that Tare didn't win with this deck last time they played. Yeah, Tare played a very uh, bizarre version of Hunter in the preliminary. Uh, he played a, a very sort of anti-aggro list with Dread Scale and a Double Explosive Trap. He's moved away from that toward a, a more sort of traditional uh, style of mid-range Hunter right now. He has a couple of, of sort of tricks up his sleeve uh, with Cloaked Huntress and Freezing Trap, but not the huge secret package you see in some versions of Hunter these days. Yeah, I, I think Hunter is also in a very interesting spot, too, because, you know, I, I do believe that if we were given an extra couple of weeks, maybe we could find the more refined versions of the Secret Hunter, for example, or maybe the discard Warlock finally starts getting some legs. Uh, we are in an interesting spot where, like, you know, just a, w a week or two weeks ago, the final wing of Karazhan was released, so people are still testing lists. And Abar even says to himself that if he was given some more time, he probably actually would play the discard Warlock. He just didn't know the right 30 cards, and he just wanted to bring the best deck he could. All right, well... Tere starts with Coin into Kindly Grandmother, one of the major features from Karazhan uh, in this deck. Definitely very potent in this matchup because it gives him the ability to trade into uh, Abar's minions, particularly that abusive sergeant, uh, since Abar does not have a Voidwalker to protect it. Yeah, um, and now it's, you know, the Hunter's in a spot where it's pretty comfortable. I like this as opposed to the Fiery Bat. It makes a lot more sense. Well, I guess there's not really much to do. You just have to play the best possible turn two and not really give your opponent the value trade that he's looking for. And uh, I imagine we will see yeah, this kindly grandmother trade into one of these and then a juggler or bat could come down. He's going to go ahead with the juggler. Juggler is a card that used to be just omnipresent in these uh, these uh, uh, hunter decks. Ooh, wow, that was a sick juggle. Protecting the juggler and the, uh, I actually don't know what that is. That's a big bad wolf, right? That's a, it comes out the other side, the yeah. kindly grandmother into the big bad wolf. Yeah. That was a huge swing there, taking out the abusive sergeant, leaving Abar uh, with no ability to fight back on this board right now. So Tare uh, with a big edge. And there's an unleash that's obviously combos quite powerfully with knife juggler, though uh, I imagine that Tare may wait to uh, take this to a little bit of a later stage of the game. That one stung, Gilbert. You can't see it. Oh, it was. It that was didn't hit the, the abusive sergeant. It hit right there. <laughs> I'm pointing at his heart. A bar right, right in the right in the chest. If you watch, if you watch it slowly, you can see the moment where his heart breaks. <laughs> click, click, click. Well, uh, you oh, know, it will be it will be the unleash here. He's gonna go ahead and throw off some knives. Oh, oh not face. The face. It was, it was does allow Tare to clear things off here and continue pushing some damage. And he still has, you know, a very powerful hand and Abar is behind in the board and this is where Zoo can really struggle. Uh, it does not perform typically very well uh, when it falls behind in the board. Yeah, and especially in this matchup too where everything is about that early game board because Hunter's got some insanely powerful late game against uh, the Zoo Warlock ranging from the high main to this Call the Wild spell. Not only just powerful late game, but also the ability to put on a lot of pressure uh, with that hero power and punish the Warlock for using its own hero power. Yeah, definitely. And here is one of those new cards from Karaz and the Cloaked Huntress. Three mana, three, four minion that allows you to play spells for free. Um, which is interesting because there's only two secrets in the list of uh, Tere, but it still gives him some ability to swing tempo, which is really cool when it works. Currently has a spider tank. Currently has a spider tank, which also wasn't the worst in pretty good. mech decks. Pretty good. Yeah. And, you know, is the, it is the bar of vanilla stats that we judge cards at its mana cost. Possibilities. Yeah. Imp gang boss, that's not a spider tank. It's not a spare tank, but it's 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 better than spare tank. It is, in fact, in most cases, better than spare tank. All right, we'll see where this okay. to the face. 
That could have gone a lot worse. Could have gone a lot worse. You are right. Always the Optimist Killer. I love it. Animal Companion getting a Leoc would be great. Leoc is, in fact, what he gets. This is an interesting situation for Tare because he has two copies of Kill Command in his oh. hand. Is he even going to bother attacking into this Imp Gang boss? He can just send damage to the face. He will take out the Imp Gang boss. Uh, though this actually gives Abar an excellent opportunity to maximize use of this Direwolf Alpha. He can clear up both minions in the board. Yeah, that ends up being very convenient because of the trades. And, you know, something worth evaluating for sure. But I think Teray's plan next turn was to play high main. So he felt like that's where he can leverage kill commands after he secured the board. I just wanted the damage to the face. I would love the damage <laughs> to the face, too. I'm attack, not a, I'm, attack my I'm, opponent down is so low and I got two kill commands in my hand. I definitely am more of a fan of hitting the face in that situation. <laughs> Given that kill commands are six damage at the minimum. Uh, if you can maximize the 10 plus the hero power, you already would be threatening lethal over three turns. Missed face, Smork. Well, uh, Abar, he's got some awesome plays. I mean, our Divine Shield taunt yeah, this, is so annoying. Killer. Yeah, this is actually uh, against a single large minion. The ability to create a board with a, a taunted Argent Horse Rider is quite powerful. Yeah, in fact, it's so annoying that Blizzard literally made a card <laughs> called Annoyatron to just <laughs> show you guys how annoying those two mechanics are when they Don't interact with each other on the same card. <laughs> That is interesting placement. Okay, so he wants not—he doesn't want that direwolf alpha to die. Yeah, he wants to protect his direwolf alpha here and force Tare to attack into uh, just the Voidwalker or the Divine Shield minion. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, this is kind of awkward for Tare. He doesn't have the ability to get this high main through. He pretty much never will. He's, he's just got to hope that he can whittle Tare down with his hero power and actually get right. those kill commands uh, to finish the game off. But Abar is threatening quite a bit of damage of his own. Well, he does have... He can actually, oh, <laughs> second Defender of Argus. Here's the thing, though. Abar's going to life tap, and that's That's death. actually just lethal, unfortunately, Unless for he clears Abar. every minion. Oh, every beast, excuse me. Yeah, he could kill each beast, but he can't possibly be playing around just kill command, kill command in the hand here. No, absolutely not. In fact, I can just see him pushing with the damage and soul fire in the 3-4 and then trying to make the, the end of the game at that point. What what, a, what an interesting sequence of events. Yeah. This or just kind of lent to itself that way. Kind of crazy here. So Tare with just the burst to finish things off here. If Abar clears all of his beasts, then he has the glimmer of hope of surviving through the turn. But I can't imagine that that will happen. Can he actually even do that? I don't, I don't he think he has enough attacks. There's one. Uh, he'd have to use the soul fire and all of his attacks, right? No, he wouldn't even be able to clear off all of the, the hyenas and the kind of grandmother and the big bad wolf. There's too many minions. He, yes. need, he needs five hits and he only has four. But he has the soul fire too. Oh, wait, you know, you're, you're yeah, right. Yeah. You're right. Uh, and I actually had no opportunity to do that. Yeah. I miscounted slightly there, but Tare oh. did not miscount here. And Kill Command, Kill Command, and Hero Power to the face will give Tare a 3 to 1 lead yeah. in this series. Super quick and fast, and, you know, honestly, a great win for the Hunter. The turn before that as well, being able to snipe both yep. of those abusive sergeants. Uh, with that, let's go and check out what Tare had to say. Uh, just a couple of comments before we go into game number five. I was promised that this one was really entertaining. Don't know why. Uh, you've, you've been around since 2014 in Hearthstone, and everybody this whole time has been pronouncing your name wrong. Everyone's been pronouncing it Ture, and it's all uh, for Dan's fault. I even told him when I uh, was at the qualifier in 2014 for BlizzCon in New York, both me and my friends specifically like taught him how to pronounce my name, which is uh, Tare, and he still got it wrong. So how'd you say his name again? Uh, for Dan. For Dan? Yeah, make sure make sure you guys all call him that okay. until he fixes his mind. Okay. <laughs> Talk to me about your life a little bit outside of the game. Um, outside of Hearthstone, I'm currently a student at CSU Fullerton, and I'm majoring in business. I was originally a physics major, and then I switched to graphic design, and then I switched to business. Do you know why you're so indecisive? It was just, you know, the typical, I guess, don't know what you want to do thing. I figured, like, if I don't know what I want to do, I might as well major in something. That works, too. If I knew that was going to be the outcome, I'd, I'd do that instantly. 
Now, uh, Therese picked up Wrath. Um, that interacts really interestingly with Arcane Giant. I'm wondering if there's a way for him to almost have it all, but I don't think he can. If he casts Starfire plus Wrath plus Innervate, I don't think he can quite cast the Arcane Giant. I think he ends up being one mana short. One mana short? Yeah. Oh, that's unfortunate. But if he draws a Moonfire... <laughs> He has, to, he has to cycle the star, <laughs> Starfire first. It's true. But if he picks up Moonfire, you're right. It would be pretty nasty. There's Malagos. But I, yeah, he's just going to use this turn to remove as much of Abar's board as he can. Uh, and then he does have just the ability to potentially play yogg Saron next turn if he wants. But he hasn't actually played that many spells this game. Yeah. Both players have kind of done very little. We can see actually by the Arcane Giant cost, uh, Tare has played seven total spells so far. Yeah. So not necessarily a, a super high impact Yogg. Oh, Antonitis comes into hand. I kind of like playing Antonitis and converting a Forbidden to Flame into a Fireball. Cash it in. Yeah, yeah why no, not? I, I, I definitely like that. He has quite a bit of burn in his hand already. Uh, and the Antonitis is a threat that your opponent is sort of committed to having to deal with. Uh, and you end up having, what, 21 points of burn left in your hand after this turn. It's a lot. Not to mention that you're putting your opponent at 21. It works out okay. Math adds up. So, I, I mean, I think that we're just going to see, you know, Yogg-Sara on this turn. I can't imagine Tare leaving uh, Antonite is up. Yeah, right. the, the classic hero power into Innervate. You know what's coming. <laughs> he was shaking his head. He's just like, oh, just don't, don't kill Antonitis. Not that many spells, though, like you mentioned. Yeah, this is now an eight cast, eight spell Yogg-Saron. We have not seen Yogg-Saron be particularly powerful oh, so silence. far. It does sound, but the, the body alone is quite threatening here. Going to get a slam there, but multi-shot, okay. He's able to take out the Source of Apprentice at least. Looks like that's it. If uh, All right, yeah, so, uh, and, and I believe Abar does not have the ability to actually Oh, actually, the, the the explosive trap on the board oh, left right. Antonitis at uh, at just two health. So explosive trap will prevent the attack to the face. So uh, Abar doesn't have the ability to. Uh, he actually don't, didn't have the ability to kill uh, Tore this turn anyway. He can only cast two of the fireballs. So he can. I imagine he'll see. Oh, he's gonna get explosive trapped. I was gonna say that I would imagine we would see him just attack mm. into the the Yogg-Saron because he has the ability to just fireball, fireball this turn, leaving Tare low enough that he can finish him off the next turn. But now that Moonglade portal in Tare's hand, because the uh, the Antonitis did die, may actually get this game kind of out of reach, except for Abar's own Yogg. Yeah, that the tr Hunter Trap is extremely hard to play around right. because there's so many ways that Hunter's secrets interact with people these days. Um, so I don't blame Abar for attacking the face. It's, you know, one, uh, it's definitely unlikely that it is an explosive trap, which is the only instance that stops Antonite's damage from being dealt. All right, well, Tare now at a relatively healthy 16 life, and he has Moonglade Portal to protect himself if he wants, but there's also just Malagos that can threaten to end the game with yeah. the burn spells in his hand. I kind of still like playing Arcane Giant because Swipe is 9 damage and Arcane Giant is 8. So if you just put it out, it's still kind of... I guess Malagos also adds his damage too. But you get to play Moonglade Portal as well. I like that a little bit better. Well, I imagine that Tare will certainly start with Raven Idol to see what he can find here. And Wrath? Living Roots. Living, Living Roots, Roots is great. really nice with the Malagos because it represents just burst next turn from Malagos. He doesn't even need to play it right now. Moonglade Portal will give him a bit of a buffer find. Ivory Knight seems appropriate for the heal. Yeah, like as if the Ivory Knight played the six mana heal. All right, well, this is putting Abar down to 22. He has 12, 13, 14, 15 on board. So uh, Abar does need to remove minions from the board or that Living Roots with Malagos does represent lethal damage next turn. Yeah, he's got the Arcane Intellect to draw. He can Fireball, remove, buy a little bit of time. Mirror Image, not necessarily a bad card if he wants to stall for time. It's a little bit awkward a piece, though, because of the 2-2 two, two, two and the 1-1 one, one surviving, potentially. I do think, like, you need to start playing spells because it's very clear you're losing control of the board here. And I'm in favor of playing spells to stall. I wouldn't even hate playing Fireball and Mirror Image just to continue to put as much spells into the Yogg. Yeah, it does seem like you need a bit of help here. 
Moonfire. Whoa, wait, that's, I don't think he quite has it still. He has, what, 13, 15? 21, right? I think oh, no. I forget that you you can't get past the one uh, the zero two. Right. Yeah. So he he can Malagos, uh, Moonfire is six living roots is seven. So he has thirteen from those, but he can't get past the uh, the mirror images. So those are keeping a bar in this game. All right. Just gonna play the Gadge Sand Auctioneer swipe allows him to cleanly remove. Debate whether or not you use Living Roots. I mean, you still have 13 damage in the hands. Living Roots right now, or rather, uh, Moonfire Living Roots right now is 8 damage as opposed to dealing uh, dealing plus 5. So it would be 7 versus 8. The first one, at least, is quite valuable. And, and now the Innervate is fantastic because it allows him to use his hero power to clear up the other one uh, and push for even more damage and draw him a card with that Auctioneer. So there you go. This okay. is a... Crucial spot for Abar. He must pray to Yag Saran. What fate does the God of Death have in mind? <laughs> it's golden. There's a start. Oh, he's returning the multi shot favor. All right, two. He's clearing the board systematically. Every single thing needs to go. There is the Malagos plus Living Room. All right, there's some armor. Oh, Astral no! Communion. No! <laughs> Oh my, we have seen so many devastating Yogg Sarads oh, defeating their man. user. Well, Fist of Jaraxxus. Does he have an opportunity to stop even the giant? It's Tiny Finn. Poor Tiny Finn, don't let it die. There it is. It's so cute. Get him, Tiny Finn. <laughs> you can do it. It's that all on you now, Tiny Finn. We're playing with real swords, right? <laughs> my magic. Our oh, last man. best hope. Well, that's going to wrap it up. Tere has the Living Roots and Mally Ghost. We have ourselves our last quarterfinalist advancing through. Tere is going to day number two. Thanks, for Dan. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Tare is going to day number two. And Abar, with the very sportsmanlike conduct, hope to see him back next year as his hopes for a BlizzCon run has ended. And this concludes our first day's matches. We have semifinalists, Dude, Hot Meowth, Rupshawn, and Ture. So don't go anywhere, guys. We have an interview with uh, Ture in just a couple of seconds here, followed by some analysis. Let's head over to Cora, who's ready with our... Thank you, Dan. I'm joined by the fourth and final semifinalist moving on to tomorrow. It is, of course, Tare. Now, Tare, you are arguably the player here with the most, you know, LAN experience having uh, competed in BlizzCon in 2014. What could this repeat performance, uh, you know, what, what does it mean to you? Uh, it means a lot to me to possibly get another opportunity to compete at BlizzCon. Um, I've always kind of not taken, like, Hearthstone 2, like, professionally, and if I could do well and make it there, I feel like this time I could give it a better shot. Absolutely. Well, congratulations, and I look forward to seeing some more awesome gameplay out of A few interviews with the players that have made it to the semifinals. Uh, but, Sam, I'm going to come to you first, just for you know, a couple words here. Uh, what are your overall thoughts on, on day one here and some of the play that we saw? I think the the downfall of the the Latin American players is a bit of a disappointment to me. I felt like you know they were the two players who really stood out, at perhaps a level above like some of the previous Latin American players that we saw. And I was hoping, you know, particularly for for Pascoa, who really impressed me in in the time that I got to talk to him. I was hoping for those guys to progress a little bit further. I know Admirable, you predicted Topo Pablo as well, but you know both of those guys uh, fell by the wayside in the first round. Latin America just still really looking for its hero in one of these HCT events. Yeah, and as we go ahead and take a look. Look at the bracket for today to look at the semifinalists. Admirable, as Saddle mentioned, uh, you predicted one of the Latin American players in Topo Pablo, but neither of them have made it through, and we've yet to see one even make it to the second round of a championship yet. Yeah, it's you know, it's, like Saddle said, I, I kind of echo his sentiments here. I I feel like the level of play was really stepped up coming into this one, and honestly, just overall today, I feel like we saw a lot of high level play taking place. You know, some spots here and there that you could really criticize, but outside of that, this was I think one of the strongest championships that we've seen from Americas. Indeed, and of course, going into day number two, the schedule is going to be just the semifinals and the finals. Pretty simple day. You could see uh, that happened there. Dude versus Hot Meowth first up, and then Rufshaw versus Tare is going to be second, and of course, followed by the finals, where we're sending another player to BlizzCon. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we're going to have uh, go through a couple of the matches today and some of our favorite plays and some crazy things that happened. So first up is going to be Dude7597 
versus Topo Pablo. And Adam, I'm going to come to you first since you actually predicted uh, Pablo to uh, take the whole thing. Um, and we had a, an interesting, uh, we, we're going to have an interesting clip here in a moment, but what do you think went wrong here? What went right for, for Dude going into this matchup? So two, two of the big things that happened here are really outside of the player's control, which was the way that the matchups actually panned out. The fact that uh, Dude was able to win the Freeze Mage versus Tempo Mage matchup, that was a very important deck for, uh, for Topo Pablo for Dude to not pick up a win on because he's trying to kind of prey on that spot in particular. And then also the fact that he got the Druid win uh, on, on the second go around, I believe it was, where that was another deck that Topo Pablo was really trying to, to focus and pick up some wins here again. So the fact that Dude was able to close those games out in particular spelled a lot of trouble for him early on. It definitely did. And these guys had pretty similar uh, decks across the board with the Tempo Mage and the Freeze Mage being the only difference. Freeze Mage, though, struggled across the rest of the field right. today in a lot of the matches. So, Saddle, is this going to be a liability for Dude as we move forward in the matchups, or is this going to be, is, is he piloting it well enough? to make it into a championship run. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, we, we'll get to it a little bit later, I'm sure, but we really saw it being the sticking point for, for Pasqua, who just really couldn't get a Freeze Mage uh, win together. It is it is one of those decks that's like such a, a high risk, high reward kind of thing to bring to these tournaments. And we see you know, Freeze Mage is, is so polarizing in its matchups and it sometimes it just looks like the most powerful deck in the format where people are really putting together those strong draws. And sometimes you really have to struggle, but Freeze Mage is a, a deck that's about eking out percentages and you know, over a long format it's a deck that you can by making the correct play in the right situation you can squeeze a win rate up to 65 percent but in a, a tournament environment when you're playing a deck that's forcing you into those corners over and over again where you're having to you know play to 35 percent outs over and over again in those single game situations in tournaments it can come back to bite you quite often yeah and speaking of freeze uh, and speaking of mage but not necessarily freeze mage we do have an interesting clip here uh with topo pablo <laughs> nice uh and admirable <laughs> This, this may be the first time I've seen a shatter used effectively in the game, let alone two shatters on the same turn. Rock, walk me through this play here from, from Topo Pablo. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this came from the fact in the previous turn when he saw this Arcane Giant that he actually didn't use Frost Nova and a shatter in this situation. He was taking this high-risk line where he suffers eight points of damage, but potentially can get way more from it. And in this spot, he got way more from it. And this was a really pivotal point in the series, I think, for Topo Pablo. If he had dropped this Tempo Mage versus Druid game, I think this would have gone on very downhill because this one's supposed to be very favored for the tempo mage. Yeah, it's 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 so important that he waited there. You know, he wasn't it wasn't like an absolute god read where it's like, okay, Arcane Giant number two is coming down next turn and I'm gonna shatter both those bad boys. But he knew that he had to wait for a, a second threat of any type to appear, you know, an Azure Drake, for example, to come down. Because otherwise he's just sat with a dead shatter in his hand, right? So using them both in the same turn with that one frost nova is actually really strong recognition for him. And it was just a hell of a cool play as well. Yeah, unfortunately it didn't mean the the series for him as he did end up losing, but that series seemed like it was all dude. And without that win from Topo Pablo, it might have even been a 4-0. Uh, but we do have our, our Frodan standing by with Dude to get his thoughts on his series earlier today. Thank you, TJ. What's up, dude? How's it going? It's uh, it's going pretty well. Probably not as good for you. I mean, as good as you, because you're just uh, flying high on it as a kite, right? Taking that victory. Uh, real quick, before we actually get to the interview part, I actually want to just trigger Sod a little bit, or potentially trigger. Uh, do you think Cabal's Tome's a good card after watching the Shatter play and the Frost Nova? Hint, answers yes. Uh, I'm not so sure. Um, oh. It's definitely... High risk, high reward, uh, but Roof Trail and Manish has stayed top 10 for basically two months in a row with a list playing double tome, so I can respect that. There you go. Okay. So he, he gives he gives some credibility to it, and thus, Sato was never the same man again. All right, let's go into the actual discussion points. Um, how, how did you actually feel going into this match, uh, specifically against Topo Pablo? He is a little bit of a wild card. Did you feel like uh, the stress catch up to you? There was times where the camera was panned on your face, and you, you were noticeably shaken up. Um, yeah, I was definitely pretty stressed out throughout the series because there are such high stakes here. Mm -hmm. um, and I was nervous. Like I mentioned before, I was talking with Admirable yesterday, and he, uh, he was telling me that he was really impressed by uh, how Topo Pablo thinks about the game. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I was nervous, but I managed to power through it. Gotcha. Is there any uh, significant plays that stood out in your mind in this game specifically that really helped define ultimately being able to turn it around to winning it? Um, and this it was what game was that showing? That was uh, the the freeze mage versus the tempo mage that they were pointing out. Okay, yeah. Um, I think the one of the biggest decisions I made was on turn five. Uh, I went ahead and used my second frost bolt on a mana worm, and um, a lot of players are reluctant to use the second frost bolt because it makes your ice lances kind of dead. 
but versus Temple Mage, they don't have any heals. Um, so I thought it would result in pretty much more damage from be being drawn if I had that extra time. Yeah, it's true. A lot of freeze mage. In general, freeze mages just are very conserved with the resource because they always feel like we have to go with this game plan. But mm -hmm. part of what makes uh, freeze mage really fun is when you play those scrappy games. You're not exactly piecing the normal wins with Alex Straza and Burn. The second clip that we wanted to go over specifically with you was uh, titled as Innervate Sagoth, uh, which should be fun because Sagoth is one of my favorite cards in the set. So just talk to me about this play here. Um, yeah, well, I knew I wanted to get the Sogoth down this turn. Uh, the main issue I had was whether or not I wanted to trade in the teacher with the wolf and uh, the reason for doing so would be that the Sogoth doesn't buy on, doesn't die on board so he has to commit extra resources to it so I thought it was a mistake at first I reacted like like I definitely thought it was a mistake but looking back <laughs> on it um, it ended up working out better for me because he bowed anyway and then he wasn't able to kill off my teacher mm -hmm. uh, so I think it ended up being fine yeah, man, you look stressed, dude. I, not not that uh, it's a bad thing, because you end up helping. You know, you end up winning through. But uh, everyone always feels like bad for you, because they're like, oh no, he's going through like he has like PTSD from the last time he played Monsanto in the prelims. Mm -hmm. Yeah, goes through it. Well, uh, congratulations, man. How do you feel about your opponent hot me out in the semifinals? Did you look forward to that at all, or is this like the first time you're thinking about it? Um, I've known hot me out a long time. We faced each other in an open, uh, probably like almost a, not quite a year ago, but like nine or 10 months ago, probably. Mm -hmm. um, we were both grinding for HCT points. Um, so I'm happy to be able to play a friend. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Uh, familiar foe indeed. Uh, is there anything else that you want to say prior to day number two before we let you go and go back to the analyst bar? I think we've pretty much summed it up. All right, well, there you go. You can see dude tomorrow play against Hot Meowth. Let's head back over to TJ and the boys back at the sidebar. Dude. Dude. <laughs> That's all you can really Sweet. say. Consistent player, consistent play, and uh... oh, look at that, dude! It's a nice prediction, dude. Yeah. Just, just, gotta, just gotta rub it in. Don't you? Just <laughs> yeah. Rub it in, huh? All right. Well, yeah. This again, is, like, it's just not mine. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like Fred said, you can see dude play tomorrow against Hot Me Out in semifinal one. But let's talk about that second quarterfinal that we saw today. It's Hot Me Out versus Monsanto. Coming in, these guys had two very different styles. And Hot Meowth managed to take the first three games, and it was yep. looking bad for Monsanto. And the zoo was sort of the undoing of Hot Meowth. Is zoo a weak spot in the America Summer Championship saddle? I think the list specifically that Hot Meowth has chosen to bring is potentially a little bit weak. He has a kind of a unique twist that was pioneered early on by Muzzy, where you're playing the, the six one-drop demons and trying to curve into demon fire that way. And then he's also playing uh, Lance Carriers in there. Um, there's some extra buffing potential, and it's a list that I tried out, and honestly, like, if you're going to take the three available zoo decks right now, you know, the discard zoo, the more pure zoo where you're just playing the Malkazar's Imp and not playing any of the extra discard cards, and then the Demon Fire version, I personally would rank the Demon Fire version at, you know, third position in that, so... His, his decision to bring that particular list, he definitely struggled with a few of the more awkward cards in the deck, um, lacking a little bit of consistency, but just kind of tumbled his way over the line in the end. Yeah, but outside of that admirable, Hot Meowth had, you know, some, he has solid decks. He, he played them really good, really well, <laughs> really good, really great. Uh, so <laughs> how, what do you think his chances are uh, moving into tomorrow into a semifinal against a very tough opponent uh, in Dude? I, I, honestly, I don't feel like the Zoo deck is, is quite as poor as Saddle's making it out to be. Uh, you know, one of the things I think he struggled with a lot of this was just Monsanto's lineup. You know, a lot of these combo decks, they prey on decks just like Zoo, yep. where they it's a very predictable curve that's happening, and so you're able to to offset that and then roll into your combo turns. And then we saw that happen over and over again when he was playing Zoo, and then finally he got through a win. Mm -hmm. uh, I think against Dude, he's not going to have quite the same trouble. Of course, I think that versus uh, versus Freeze Mage, it could potentially be a big uh, hurting like a spot where he suffers from that. But I think overall, that Zoo deck is incredibly aggressive. And in a field like this, I feel like you should be taking more risk with that damage and trying to get those incredibly strong draws that put people off of their game because these aren't ladder opponents that you're playing against you're not facing generally weaker opponents uh, you know at times you're playing against people who fought through a field of over 128 players to earn this spot and dude a very formidable opponent i think he needs that sort of draw potential in his deck to to find an edge yeah, and both of these players sort of coming from similar backgrounds with uh, high ladder finishes lots of open tournament play um and sort of just building their way up from the North American scene. So definitely looking forward to that one. Uh, but to get a few more thoughts on his match for the day, we got Frodan standing by with Hot Meowth. Hot Meowth. What's up, man? What's up, um, Frodan? It's been pretty good. That last game against Monsanto was pretty stressful. I got, I got it in the bag. 
and almost got reverse swept. <laughs> yeah. But it's well, a nice thing I got in. What's going through your head during that process? You told me that this was kind of expected, right? That Zoo was a target. So were you kind of feeling like, ah, all right, whatever. I just had to win one game. But then started getting more nervous as he started losing more games and more games. Yeah, I certainly got a little tilted. But I know, like, um, he has Freeze Mage and Wogan Warrior, which is, like, super... I wouldn't say super favorite, but it's, like, pretty favored against um mm -hmm. my Zoo deck. It's, like, 75-25 in his favor. So I know, like... Uh, those games were meant for me to lose, right? But I just need to like get over it and like just focus mm -hmm. and keep going. Cause his any fin is like slight favor too. But I just need to like know that I'm gonna win eventually. So despite the fact that you know the matchup is heavily polarized, it still kind of got you like a little upset that you lost three in a row there. Yeah, it's kind of tilting. Yeah, I've <laughs> I've been there before for sure, for sure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about something that you brought up too is the Warrior versus Druid matchup. Now this matchup's uh, very interesting to me, but you have a lot to say about it. So why don't we bring up the clip and uh, start chatting away? Yeah. So um, I say this matchup is um generally like it can go either way. That's why I like to pick that. So Warrior is really interesting because like there's different range of like what the combo is and like. And Monsanto's list is kind of interesting. Like it's not like um, it's kind of different from the Center Morgan list, where it, it doesn't have Rampage or Crew Task. So like the lethal range is kind of different. And he has second Rogan and second Charge. So I have to calculate like how to play around that and like how to like um, get my health total at the right spot while like trying to like pressure him. But here I think like Yogg is kind of big dude because like it, it, he, I can't like leave a Rogan on board and like I really didn't have um anything that can directly answer that in that moment. So I think it's pretty good that it cleared it. Like Yogg, like generally people think it's kinda like Doom where like it board clears mm -hmm. and draws it draw, cards. draws cards, which is like pretty good in a situation that happens. And then like um after that I got um Moon um Sun Sunwalker off Mungapura and kinda see what to do. But generally it's just like you need to know like when to like go off and when to play safe because like it's Rogan like anything can happen because like there's just a lot of burst potential. It's true. You just need to know like lethal range because like with that it's kind of different from the Rogan you're used to like play where you have one Rogan one charge and um Rampage and crew task like the lethal range is kind of different so yeah. you really understand that. It's it's also really sneaky because you know charge is also a second source of damage so like sometimes he has uh, inner rage charge charge and then phase so you have to calculate all these possibilities and stuff. So really uh, cute stuff but thank you for that breakdown. You know dude didn't, just had some comments about going up against and saying that you guys are buddies. Is that really true? Are you friends with him? He's not listening. Yeah I mean all right. I've been friends with um, I, I have um dude added on my account like before like even like He's like, he's like a noob in opens playing Secret Paladin and Armory. That's Are you right. following him on Twitter, though? Yeah, we follow each other like a few months now. Yeah. It's official. We just play Congrats. on ladder and open tournaments a lot. And we played in a um, Collegiate Hearthstone tournament like a while back. It was a long time Call ago. Call of Duty tournament? No, Collegiate Hearthstone. Oh, Collegiate. <laughs> yeah, not Call. Not call. Like, now that's not, a format I want to play in Hearthstone. All right. Yeah, we're like <laughs> yeah, a team of three for, for, for your college friends. And oh, there you, you go. That's where it started. Where I get to know Dude, you. you totally no-scoped him with that young. All right, well, let's head over back to TJ and Sidebar. Congratulations and good luck tomorrow. Had him on his friends list since he was in Doob playing Secret Paladin in Opens. Mm. That's what he said about Dude. And now they got to face off against each other. So let's talk about this uh, matchup as a whole. These guys have sort of similar lineups, but that big difference uh, sort of being that Freeze Mage and that Zoo. And we all know how that matchup goes with the Freeze Mage having a significant edge. Does that make a difference if we're talking about sort of like the seventh deck or the, the deck for game number seven, if it comes down to Freeze Mage versus Zoo, or is it, there's a lot more to it than that, Sala? I mean, there's always a lot more, you know, in a, when you're looking at Conquest lineups lining up against each other, there's always a lot more than any one individual matchup. It's really hard to boil Conquest as a format down to, you know, I have this one deck that beats my opponent's deck and that puts me in a strong position. It's just always more complex than that. It's about the lineups overall and how they interact with each other. Um, so sure, like Freeze Mage having a strong matchup against Zoo is, is a factor, but there are many, many more outside of that. All right, so uh, admirable. Just to get your thoughts on that semifinal matchup uh, quickly, based off of their play today, based off what we know from these two players, make a bold prediction of who's gonna who's gonna come out on top of that. Yeah, one. I mean, if I got to base it just purely on the play, I'm going with Dude in this one. I think he played his set fantastic. I think he was looking for the right spots to be really aggressive uh, in his set as well. And then also, I do agree the Freeze Mage is, is kind of a big talking point here. You know, where the band sits in for this one, I think that makes a big impact on the way both players see it. I mean, it's very clear I think at this point that Dude's intent is to is to ban warriors away. Yeah. 
Uh, but curious how that that reacts to Hot Meowth. You know, does he feel like he needs to ban Freeze Mage? Does he feel like he needs to ban, uh, you know, maybe potentially the Warrior from from Dude? I mean, it's a lot of scary stuff going on. Because I feel like the Warrior could be a lot of trouble for for Hot Meowth as well. I mean, he tops out at the Grom and the Ragnaros and the Curator. He doesn't have a Nixia. He doesn't have Deathwing. These large, clunky, dead draws oftentimes against some of the more aggressive builds that are there. Uh, so curious to see where that's going to go. Yeah, so that'll be the first semifinal matchup tomorrow. So make sure you guys don't miss that one because it'll be a pretty high-level series. Uh, but uh, let's start talking about the third match that we saw today, the third quarterfinals, Pasqua versus Roof Trellin. And this one went the distance. Oh, yeah. Went all the way to game number seven. Very intense matchups back and forth. But Roof Trellin came out on top. And Sano, he came in with a really unique lineup and got himself a spot in the semifinals. Talk me through sort of uh, this match for Roof Trellin. Yeah, I mean, it, it seemed like the, the ultimate head versus heart matchup at the end of it. You know, Roof Trellum, just the, his story was that he just came in, he's, he's playing the stuff that he loves, he's playing the stuff that he's comfortable with, whereas uh, Pasqua went through this heavy analytical, you know, metagame reads and percentage-based uh, picks on his lineup, and he brought, you know, in his mind, the solved lineup for this tournament that he felt really, really comfortable with. Uh, but in the end, we just saw it come down to that Freeze Mage, every single game loss against that Freeze Mage in the end, and he just couldn't pick up a win with it in the end. All four, yeah, and uh, we have a clip here from game number seven uh, of this matchup between the Control Shaman and the Freeze Mage, where a very key card was yeah. picked up from Farsight. So admirable. <laughs> Walk me th through sort of the implications of this card in the freeze against the Freeze Mage. Matchup. I mean, my goodness, this is just the Jin card if you're if you're in Roof Trail and Spot. Not only is Ragnaros probably one of the most powerful minions in the game versus Freeze Mage, uh, but the fact that he's got it on turn four. I mean. This, but imagine like when a druid double innervates out Ragnaros against Freeze Mage. They're just right. they're often gonna win that game. Now the thing about it is Roof Trellin's build is much heavier than that. There's a lot of utility cards in here. And that Ragnaros played such a pivotal role in him dominating that game because so many resources got poured into that Ragnaros that there was never an opportunity for Pascoa to catch back up. He was always playing one turn behind after that. Yeah, so uh, three Ragnaros or Ragnarai in Roof Trellin's deck list. Uh, definitely gave him that edge against Freeze Mage, so it was sort of a good meta read by him. Uh, uh, there was another clip that we had, though, um, which was sort of sort of a tough line uh, to call here. It was uh, in one of the games where uh, Roof Trellin was playing against Freeze Mage with his Temple Mage, and uh, this is sort of a, a little bit of a debatable play. He, he hadn't checked in the secrets, and instead of pinging, he actually decided to attack face with the Sorcerer's Apprentice here. Subtle. Is this a missequence, or what? What is he trying to to play around in, in this kind of situation? I mean, it is it is just incorrect. You know, we we at the same time we are, uh, were casting this game, and we both assumed that it was Ice Block at the time as well. You know, we weren't really paying as much attention as we could have been. But you know, admirable. I think you have a greater point here about just you know making sure you are focused at all times and playing optimally. Yeah, this is just really a kind of more of an example of the mindfulness that you need to have in every single situation at all times. I mean, this is such a minor little detail that makes a colossal difference at the end of the day. That secret had not been checked yet. It could have been Ice Barrier. It could have been Ice Block. And in this situation, if you choose to just Hero Power, the first check on this right now is we're going to find out if it's Ice Barrier or if it's Ice Block. We don't have to actually attack with a minion. In this case, that check of the Hero Power, rather than the attack, pulls away the liability that Ice Barrier could present. And it would have resulted in an instant game win on that situation. And it's just an example of the tiniest little details making those huge differences. Every single edge matters. And in this one, thankfully for Roof Trellin, it didn't end up mattering. But in a, in a different situation, a different world, you could be looking at a potential different champion because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, great meta reads by Roof Trellin. Some overall great play over the course of the series. But uh, we'll see if he can focus up and, and take it to the semifinals. But to get some words from, from Roof Trellin himself, let's uh, check in with Dan at the caster desk. How you doing, Roof Trellin? I'm doing swell. Good, good. I'm glad. Uh, that was pretty brutal s review segment from the analysts. Uh, you heard everything. Do you agree with what they say? Um, yeah, I can agree with what they say, yeah. Is TJ still a good friend after listening to him just talk about your plays like that? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. He's dead to me. I love this guy. Let's talk a little bit about that uh, Ragnaros thing. I think um, one of the interesting things, too, is just, like, how that matchup ends up playing out because, you know, the control decks tend to flounder a little bit against uh, Freeze Mage. So why don't you just walk me through what you're thinking during these turns. Obviously, you're really happy Ragnaros comes into your hand. Um, 
but just like you know how, when he plays like double doomsayer and then the, the mirror image like what's what, what, what's going through your head when you're just like i'll just let those go instead of fishing for cards to try to save it like ancestral spirit well first of all i was really happy to get the ray because that's a really bad matchup but ragnaros can kind of give you a chance to win it um otherwise the game ends up taking too long and you end up getting killed in one turn but um once he had like used everything to clear my reg, I wasn't too upset. Like I wanted to see if I could keep my reg alive somehow, but um, knowing he used so many resources uh, to kill it, uh, it just helped. Yeah, I mean, now that you had like the Doomsayers out of the way, then a lot of those other big minions are less like vulnerable to freeze. Like Doomsayer plays. Yeah. yeah, precisely, precisely. Now, um, I did have a, a question about um, the the Eater of Secrets here, so we can just pull up the clip. Uh, how how awesome, or what was going through your mind specifically when you saw Eater of Secrets being pulled here off the Raven Idol? I was just like, didn't even remember that was even a card because <laughs> you haven't seen it in so oh. long, and the, that's just a free win, that card. It's like only good in this matchup. <laughs> your face, man, was just like, not bad. Uh, after good. after I ripped those wisps off the top too, like I was just drawing like crazy back to back. Yeah, I just felt invincible right during yeah. that times. So. You you were kind of mentioning in your interviews that you just really enjoy that aspect, especially like the discover stuff. Or I mean, people are saying that you know when you got to number one with your Cabalist tome, it's just that, that defines you because it's been a while since we've seen uh, the second coming of RNG. Is that you, Roof Trellin? Are you the the next one? Are you the chosen one? Well, RNG usually does tend to favor me, and uh, I don't mind being seen as such an RNG list because I could be him. Maybe I'm praying to the wrong one. Yeah. You have to show me your ways, oh holy one. Congratulations, man, and good luck on your match tomorrow. Do you have any uh, you know, opinions on your upcoming match uh, against your opponent tomorrow in the semifinals? Uh, yeah, I respect Terry a lot, so uh, he might have like the best lineup uh, of anybody's first mine. So uh, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. I like your roof. You you said to Ray. <laughs> I don't feel as bad anymore. <laughs> or maybe that's because of me. I don't know. Let's go back over to TJ in his sidebar and get ready to uh, talk to our last contestant for tomorrow. I was the one giving Roof Challenge praise over here on this desk. And now apparently I'm not his friend anymore. All I know is I, I still cannot see that Eater of Secrets. <laughs> it's, it's just a blank spot. I have no idea. Oh, my goodness. Eater of Secrets <clears throat> blind. Yeah. All right. Well, let's start talking about... <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's start talking about the fourth match of the day. Uh, it was Abar versus Tare. And this matchup was interesting because it was a repeat of a match that happened in the preliminary mm -hmm. uh, in the actual decider match. And it had a much different outcome. Abar won that one three to, three to one. And now Tare comes back and wins that one, this one four to one. And this was how both players had thought it was going to go. This is how, in the prelims, Abar thought he was unfavored. Mm -hmm. And he came into this one with similar lists, and Tare came out on top. So. Uh, walk me through this match a little bit. Not too much to say here, but ha about how their lineups were supposed to match up subtle. I mean, the, the the first thing that jumps out to me is a point that you made backstage while we were watching this, that this is uh, Abar's first defeat in competitive Hearthstone. It's the first game, first series that he has lost in a Hearthstone tournament. The preliminary was the first tournament that he entered, made it all the way through here, and now the, the brutal nature of single Elim has sent him packing, but um, this is a big turn in the, the mid-range Shaman. I was, I was sat next to Admirable watching this, and Admirable's first reaction looking at this is that any reason why we don't do infinite damage to the opponent, <laughs> I believe were the words that came out, yes. to which I quickly responded responded, no, no, there is not. And that's exactly what is going to happen here. Flame Tongue Totem and Rock Bioweapon Weapon coming out. Just way too much damage. Takes the, the Warlock down to two, I believe, which takes away the life tap. So no one card was going to get him out of this mess. So um, the, the Midrange Shaman, just an incredibly powerful deck right now on ladder as well. It's really you know starting to overtake the more aggressive um, lists in terms of popularity. And once again, we saw Zoo struggle to get a win. Admirable. Is this a theme that's going to repeat itself throughout the throughout the, the championships, yeah, not just Americas, but even through Europe and Asia Pacific? Well, I think this definitely sends kind of a message over to those regions there where, they, where they're seeing it struggle. This deck needs to be refined a lot more than it currently is right now. I mean, we just went through Karazhan giving us a lot of new options for this. And like Sadl said, there's basically three different kinds of versions of Zoo you could build right now, where one sort of has this discard package where you're trying to draw extra cards and power out silverware golems. One of them is this demon fire build where you're trying to take advantage of the extra demon synergy you got in the form of Malkazar Zimp. And the other one is the one that Tare's running, which is just the sort of standard tried and true list that we saw prior to this. But that was where I think we saw Zoo struggle the most was when it was very commonly played and just couldn't get the job done. So I, I think for Tare, if there's a weak spot in his lineup, I would consider it that Zoo deck at the moment. Uh, but I think that deck has a lot of work to go. 
Okay. Uh, well, we do have a Tari Eye standing by. <laughs> I believe that's how you pronounce it. Not quite sure. Uh, with Frodan, who uh, I don't know if they're going to get any analyzing done unless it's about how to pronounce Tari's name. Hey, Tari. How's it going? <laughs> hey, Frodan. It's not <laughs> going too bad. Yeah, you're doing well. You're uh, back in the winter seat, uh, something that you're not unfamiliar with. How are your feelings on the series overall? Were there any th moments that stuck out in your mind specifically? Um, not really. It felt pretty nice to do well and win. Was it like all <laughs> a blur in your mind, just kind of just happened, and now it's just like you don't even really remember what, what, what went down? Sort of, yeah. I don't know. Usually when I play, I'm pretty focused, so I just kind of zone everything else out. Gotcha. Was there, I mean, you kind of mentioned before that you felt like Abar was still kind of new to the, the competitive scene, so it was like your advantage. Did that show at all in the series, you think? Yeah, I definitely think so. Like, I would even say, like, my advantage is all the, like, failures I've had in the past and mistakes I've made. Mm -hmm. I've learned a lot from them, so... That definitely helped me as well. Gotcha. Um, can, do you, can, can you be a little bit more specific? Like, is there any moment that you felt like, oh, okay, like, I, kn I know that kind of mistake. Was he, like, too conservative in some areas or too aggressive in others? Like, was there any kind of moment that you can recall? Um, yeah, I think in general it's kind of his play style and the way he likes to play, but he's uh, pretty YOLO. And, <laughs> and uh, like, for instance, uh, the Druid game, he double innervated a oh, teacher yeah, out. That's and right. that time it worked out for him. But then the next time, uh, in the zoom mirror, he just like uh, flame imped and then coined a soul fire on turn one as well. Mm -hmm. And then he ended up just kind of like running off cards and stuff to do. Yeah. So it, it does feel like uh, he was a little bit more aggressive and it didn't exactly work out in his favor. Um, looking forward to tomorrow. You're playing against Roof Tron. He's the one that has a bunch of weird decks. How does your lineup f match up against his? Do you feel confident at all? Um. I feel pretty confident because, in general, those decks aren't considered very good. But, um, you know, he's Roof Trellin, and <laughs> <laughs> those decks, you don't play against them that much, so they can be kind of scary. They are scary, man, especially if he's ripping Ragnaros off our site. It's going to be uh, really hard to come back from, indeed. Um, all right, man, well, I mean, it's pretty much it for the general questions there. Uh, good luck tomorrow. It would be really awesome to go back to BlizzCon again this year, wouldn't it be? Yeah, it would be. Yeah, for sure. So I hope I hope you can see you perform your best tomorrow. Good luck and uh, wish the best for day number two. Uh, that pretty much wraps it here. So once again, we're going to send it over to TJ and the sideboard to get closing thoughts before we send you guys off for day one. So that semifinal, uh, a little bit more of an exciting one with Roof Trellin versus Tare. Uh, they both have sort of a little bit different deck lineups with Tare having the Control Warrior and Roof Trellin just... Being Roof Trellin, as yeah. Tori so eloquently put it. So looking at how these decks line up, Saddle, mm -hmm. everybody seems to think, even Roof Trellin himself, that Tari is favored. But w what are your thoughts after after seeing these guys side by side? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think Ro Roof Trellin's lineup, you know, they are their comfort picks, as we've talked about. But, you know, some of them are just a little bit antiquated at this point. He's running a very, very old-fashioned Druid list, you know, token-based. No Arcane Giants in there, which just seems baffling to me. Um, you know, Tare, his, his decks are just a, a little bit more modern, apart from, uh, you know, the, the zoo deck, which is a, a little bit, you know, the, the plain and simple zoo, none of the fancy stuff, none of the demon fire discard package. But um, I just think that Tare just has, you know, more, more up to date, more powerful, more consistent decks, really taking advantage of the, the current meta. Uh, whereas Roof Trellin is just a, a little bit stuck, you know, um, back in the prelims meta, if you like. Mm -hmm. And Roof Trellin. Even in some of the pieces that we saw from him today, he was saying how he never really played in tournaments, got most of his points from ladders, mostly a ladder sort of hero. And Tare has experience on a very big stage, seems really calm in his matches today as well as in his interviews. Admirable, is this experience, is this going to carry him to the finals of championship in going into the semifinals tomorrow? Well, I think that's a really important thing to note is when you watch Roof Trellin play and in his set, he kind of did play like it was ladder play. And again, he feels like having fun is a big portion of the game and it's very important for him to just be enjoying himself while he's playing but the thing I'd like to see from him more is just kind of slow down his pace of play he's had some of the more complicated turns out of all the players in this championship so far and and some of his turns have been taken like in under 10 seconds when he's got so many different lines of play to consider and the only thing I'd like to see from him is just to slow down his pace of play even if he's making the same conclusion as his instinct to just make sure he's dotting his I's and crossing his T's because sometimes you can come up with a brilliant play where you have a strong one and it can be the difference in winning and losing a game. 
All right. Well, that one should be fun. Real quick, guys, I want to get your predictions going into that semifinal so you can look either really good or really bad going into tomorrow uh, for uh, first semifinal and second semifinal. Go, Subtle. I'm going to go Hot Meowth and Tare. All right. Admirable. Dude, Tare. All right. Well, it's unanimous on Tare, but the first semifinal uh, is a little bit split. So those will happen tomorrow. Definitely looking forward to those. And that'll happen at 9 a.m. Pacific. But make sure you guys tune in for the pre-show, which will go live at about 8.30 a.m. Pacific. Uh, but let us know what you guys thought of the matches today. You can uh, head on social media and uh, join in on the conversations. You can tweet at Play Hearthstone or head over to Facebook.com slash.